here to welcome today Christo Huisen. Um, he's the CTO of Control Technologies. And he's also the leader of the Cape Town OWASP meetup. Very interested in InfoSec also. He runs a local meetup in Cape Town there as well. Uh, so clearly quite a community player. And he's talking to us today about async and panic and um, async with more of a flask-like feel. OK, um, let's get going. So excuse me if I'm a little extra crazy today, lack of sleep and being sick, and uh, uh, Cape Tonian, so the weather doesn't work for me. Um, but uh, I've been working with SANEC for about 10 months. Uh, so this is a little bit of my experience, and uh, maybe all of you can learn something about it or go, hell no, this guy's crazy. Um, so this is me. Uh, I work for Control. I'll talk about that now. Wasp Cape Town, uh, DevOps, Python. I've been all over the place. Uh, so this is what I do for a day job. Uh, it's a insurance app. Uh, we're launching in the next two weeks to a month. Uh, and it's built around Python and Ionic. AWS and Firebase, and I'm looking for back-end developers. So if you, as crazy as me and you love Python 3.7, hit me up. Um, so as mentioned, I help run OWASP Cape Town, but also this year I'm being registered as a director of B-Sides Cape Town, uh, a local Pacific uh, community-run uh, conference um, in December, so to give you a little teaser of what we do, uh, we do uh, talks, but every year so far we've had an electronic badge. This one you could play Pong, and it had an infrared sensor, so with a Django server while people were um, networking um, at the conference. We actually, anon well, we anonymized the data, but we, we gamified it and looked at who actually uh, did the most networking. It's all based on the ESP8266. Um, the same guy who designed it, designed this. It doesn't really work anymore. But uh, this was the Monero badge at DEF CON this year in the US. So if you want to come and check it out afterwards and ask me about it, you're welcome to do so. So uh, it's the 1st of December in OBS in Cape Town. Um, I think tickets are around 200 bucks. It's quite cheap. It's a whole day of InfoSec. Uh, you get lunch and drink afterwards there's usually a capture the flag and the badges so come and join us so uh, let's talk about the talk um, so like I said sometimes I'm a little crazy so I'm gonna talk about a framework and a fairly new one so you take your own perspective of the crazy goose so everyone always calls me goose so you can do that too um, but um, just some of the limitations. Um, I'm on Python 3.7 with Sanic at the moment, so that's my perspective. Um, focused on async IO with UV Loop, um, and Sanic and the Magic Stack uh, projects. And I'll show you a little bit, uh, just a proof of concept I built a while back. And I'm not an expert on Twist and a Tornado, and I'm not here to bash any other frameworks or ways of doing things. Even Flask, I love Flask, I've pulled a lot of stuff in it. I've worked in a little bit in Django, a little bit in uh, Falcon, and each one has its own uh, pros and cons. So um, I'll kind of talk about my story uh, with Sanic in, in this format. So we'll talk about async, just a primer for those who don't know. Actually, let's ask the question, how many of you are in an async uh, code base at the moment. How many of you are enjoying it? That's great, even better. Um, so I'll just I'll, I'll skip through that quickly, um, and then I'll kind of talk about why async made sense for us. Then I'll talk about Magic Stack and UV Loop. Uh, then a little bit about Sanic, the libraries around it, uh, some of the code uh, to show you um, what it looks like, and then some other things around async I/O. 
um, that I find really interesting? And then do we profit or is it nirvana? So some of you might have seen this at PostgreSQL. Um, generally, the CPU and its caches and even RAM is quite quick. As soon as we hit disk or network, we usually end up um, waiting a lot. And uh, this has led to the asynchronous way of doing things. Um, at its basic form, you've got an event loop, um, things coming in that you want done, uh, callbacks. Uh, you have different kinds of intensive operations, which um, gets done and then comes back when it's done and uh, tries to prevent your code from locking up. Um, a more simpler view of it, you've got an event queue. The event loop runs it. Uh, you've uh, access the file system or the network, or you process something, and it gets put back on the event queue, and your application uh, calls it back. Um, so I'm just going to show this quickly. It's a nice little um, JavaScript. Of course, it's JavaScript. Um, a little demo of, of what it would look like visually. Um, so as you add events, the browser doesn't lock up. It processes things and puts it on queue and returns it. So a really good example of how async really, really works is Jupyter Notebook. Um, I think it's running on Twisted or Tornado. I can't remember which one. Um, so that's just kind of an idea of uh, what we're looking at. Um, so our best example of where this really made uh, uh, people wake up is on the left, you've got kind of the Apache web server kind of way of doing things, and on the right, Nginx. And Nginx again, where it uh, gets new connections as a task, handles it async, and returns it. Um, so Nginx isn't locking up as much, so a lot of you will have seen Nginx as a great reverse proxy in the past. And this is kind of uh, where we're trying to go with this. Uh, so why async? Um, so I found this on someone else's slides, but generally we want to optimize waiting periods, especially in my case, and I'll explain that later. Um, we're not using all the CPU cores. We could. We could multi-process, um, but I'll talk about that later. It scales well. It's easy to read the code and write it, and we're um, not fighting the GIL and Python, so the global interpreter lock where one thread's executing at one given time. Um, and to kind of illustrate uh, using a, a database with a bunch of calls, we want to try and pipeline it so that there's less waiting times in the orange. Um, so why personally did I end up uh, looking at this? And uh, why did I go from a kind of worked with Python 2.7 and just 3.5 with Falcon in the past is uh, when I joined Control, we had to integrate with insurers. And insurers have what's called a black box. And you send it all your information. It works out your risk, comes back with the price that you're going to pay for your insurance as a quote. Uh, the problem is, especially on the staging systems and sometimes on the production systems, uh, your waiting times are quite long. So I've had... Uh, quotes run for 15 minutes. Um, and that is how, even if you're uh, using salary and uh, a queue, it's still a hellishly long wait uh, for HTTP request. I um, started looking at async IO just to uh, utilize the system better. We're also using uh, Slack and Intercom and Firebase and Redis. All of it has some uh, network I.O., so I wanted to optimize for that as much as possible. Um, but at the same time, I had the question about what is something that would feel familiar to me, which would help me to learn and quickly become really good at uh, async code. So uh, I started researching a bit. Um, I had some time. At the time, I was building the front end more than the back end. So I had some time to research the problem, and I came across uh, Magic Stack uh, in my reading. So uh, they love putting up these uh, blog posts. They've got two uh, where they have stats for different. Um, so for async PG, they compare it to AIO PG, 
and they give you stats on how fast it is. The only problem is you never find the data that they used. They give you the methodology, but I can't reproduce it. Um, but with UV loop, um, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll not go into UV loop just yet. Um, so these two guys are behind my Magic Stack, and the guy on the left, he's actually a core Python developer and worked with Guido quite a lot. Um, he's quite influential with Async IO, and he um, works with a couple of big companies and looked at different ways of doing things. Um, I love that quote on the website, any sufficiently advanced software is indistinguishable from Magic. Um, so UV loop, um, they looked at LibUV, which is um, uh, Node.js's event loop. Uh, it's written in C, um, it's lightning quick, and it's battle tested. It's also used by Julia, PyUV, and others, and a big focus on asynchronous I.O. So in uh, Cython, they wrote a wrapper called UV loop. Um, because async I.O. is pluggable, um, they then started working on getting UV loop to work with normal async I.O. and look at the performance benefits uh, of it. And um, with almost any async I.O. Uh, program, you can just swap out to UV loop, and you might or might not get a performance boost. But they claim about a, a double increase in speed. Um, so uh, one, one quite great thing about uh, libuv, it, it covers EPL and KQ, so covers uh, Linux and the BSDs, FreeBSD and OpenBSD. Uh, it does support Windows with some hackiness. Um, you've got child processes, thread pooling, um, asynchronous DNS, TCP and UDP, and file system access. So a lot of great uh, stuff to work with, and IPC built in as well. So not only are you running things asynchronous, you have the ability to fork to thread. And using UV loop and some of the, the stuff they did, uh, they built async PG, uh, which was mentioned in the previous talk. Um, they, they looked at the existing libraries. Um, some people just wrapped a existing synchronous library like AO, AIOPG, um, but they said, let's look at this from a fresh uh, perspective. So they saw that um, that Postgres had a had a binary protocol, and you could use prepared statements. So they optimized for speed. They wanted um, more records per second scanned. So um, it's also quite a little bit of boilerplate. Um, and they've optimized it around the async, uh, async await uh, syntax. Um, and it is pretty quick. Um, so these are their claimed uh, stats. So uh, apparently faster than Golang, even with the normal C um, lib PQ. Um, so this is where my critical brain comes in and says madness. Uh, give me the data so I can try this myself. I mean, the workload could have been super simple to get that kind of uh, result, and also claim quite low latency. Um, so we get to Sanic. So um, based on the stuff they'd done with UV Loop, uh, someone looked at uh, Flask, thought, I really like the syntax, I really like the thinking, but I want to work async IO into it. Um, and it's got a meme, so unfortunately I have to um, meme in a, the first time ever in a presentation. So it's based on the Sonic meme of a, a funny looking Sonic that has to go fast. So that's kind of their motto, is gotta go fast. And you can actually switch this off in the terminal, just by the way. Every time you start it, this pops up, it's rather annoying. Um, so. Uh, firstly, it aspires to be simple. So just like Flask, uh, when you read the code, for the most part, it's simple, it's easy to understand. It's a micro framework, um, Python 3.5 and plus, obviously. Um, async request handlers, async await syntax, UV loop built in by default. You can swap it out, um, even at install time. You can also install it for Windows. Never tried that, never will. Um, and familiar routing. 
So the same kind of routing API um, syntax, but obviously underneath they've changed things up a bit. Um, more features, it has workers, so you can actually start it up with uh, multiple processes, um, and it uses async IO's uh, forking so that it's not blocking, um, and it works pretty good uh, routing and WebSocket routes. So um, it even allows streaming, which is great. It has middleware already, static file serving, SSL. Um, so just like Flask, it can do blueprints to group uh, routes together and class-based views. Um, so that's kind of the general hello world. Um, pretty easy to understand if you're coming from a, a Flask world. Um, and you can see they've got all their own implementations, uh, a response JSON uh, that's non-blocking, and that's generally uh, where you usually start out. Um, and I say start out because it starts looking like madness later on. Um, even authorization, you can put a decorator on a route, um, and you can modify it um, to add session storage, etc. Um, and testing, so they've actually thought of a couple of things, um, even though it's still at, I think, 0 0.8 at the moment version. Um, they've got a lot of functionality, so it actually starts up an app client, so it starts up uh, SANIC, the web server, and then async uh, HTTP test uh, your routes, and you can mock, um, you can even do uh, fixtures, so um, they've uh, thought of quite a few things. You can add PyTest async, and they have their own PyTest SANIC, um, so it's pretty great that um, some of your longer running uh, requests or tests um, just run in the background and report back um, once they're completed. Um, we can look at that later, and a lot of, lot of libraries. So. Um, we've got Ginger 2 support, uh, JWT tokens, which I've implemented myself, uh, Open API and Swagger, uh, which has also been a great tool um, with other people integrating. You've got uh, CRUD, REST API, um, core setting sessions, uh, and then tons more, even a Prometheus uh, library. You've got... Uh, Redis integration, there's, there's 100 things. So um, quite a bit of a community already around it. Oh, goodness, cutting off part of it. But um, initially, it was driven by a single developer on his uh, GitHub account. And after some time, there was just too many pull requests. And they've actually moved it to an organization so that they can keep on uh, innovating and keep on going. Um, so let's look at some code, since I'm talking rather fast, I'll try and uh, slow it down a bit. Um, might actually be better. So um, just as a simple example that I've done before and just put on GitHub, uh, I add a couple of routes, um, so you've got a, a main route uh, with just a hello world and a UUID just to show that uh, it's not caching requests or it's doing a little bit of work. Um, and then I've added a little async PG connect. Now this is not a proper implementation because I actually create and close the connection every time. Uh, very, very uh, inefficient. You can create an async PG pool um, and do multiple connections, and then the pool will actually handle the async um, calls going out. Uh, sorry. Um, and uh, just added some query time, query received, and just a little bit of error checking. So fairly simple. Uh, running one worker, we can up up that if necessary. Uh, uh, what else? Have I missed anything? So that, I apologize, should be like that. Um, 
so on the other side. So just using async PG, um, I've actually used the normal JSON there, which is not a good idea, and Sonic. If we look at the other side, um, and actually I've missed something, so before we go to that, uh, part of uh, kind of my research I've been doing, um, I came across uh, this project by a guy who works at Facebook, um, and why I quite like this, what he's done is, if we go down a little bit, um, is that he has taken the multi-processing side of um, AA Sync IO and just uh, asynchronous uh, event and kind of combined it in a nice API. So what you can do with this, and he hasn't uh, indicated, but you create a pool of processes. So uh, let's say you've got four CPUs to use, and you have to crunch a lot of data, what you can do with this. Uh, so here he's using a um, just a request example. Um, but you could, for instance, if you're doing something with data science, you've got a lot of data that you just need to filter through. Um, so recently I had to do about 30 gigs worth of network data for a master's project. And I tried this by taking the data and dividing it in four. Each process gets one chunk of data and then you still run it async. So each pool, each process in the pool gets its own event loop. And once it's executed, it executes and then reports back to the main process and you can aggregate all the data. So you can actually create a pretty nice little load testing tool with this. Um, I forget, there's a pretty good talk about it um, that I can recommend where they talked about, I think it's an object store that they've built around this um, and they just needed more processing around it. Async IO was just not doing um, enough for them because they just had so much data to process. So in terms of that, um, I've used the process in the pool um, and then just the normal multiprocessing library to count the CPUs. And I've used AIOHTTP, an amazing, amazing library that I've used a lot. Um, and we simply pass it a URL and it'll hit, um, it'll do an async call. So if I've divided it up into two parts. Um, we've got a run async only, and we've got a run with AIO multiprocess just to kind of see um, how different workloads differ. So a workload that's not CPU intensive, you're probably not going to get a lot of uh, speed improvement because you're spending a lot of time context switching and starting up uh, new processes. But if we just look at the async example, so what I've done is there's the root um, URL and I've just uh, incremented the array um, by a request number and I've created a complaints endpoint that'll hit async PG and with a generator, I'm just taking um, out of ASCII two random uh, uppercase letters to do a, a like query in SQL. Um, and then once you have all the URLs, I've chained them, so creating a single uh, list, and then that list gets um, passed into the uh, method, and async gather then fires them all off, gathers them together, and then I can look at the results. Um, that's kind of the methodology and then just kind of like looking at the time it took uh, to do all of that. Uh, AIO multiprocess, similar setup, uh, all the URLs that we're going to hit, but then um, using the CPU counts, uh, I'm counting uh, obviously with multi-threading times two and I'm just minus, uh, it's an old habit of mine, minusing one to keep one a little uh, less busy, and then pretty much the same where we map the to uh, the inputs, what we get out of it. 
Um, so you'll see only one worker at the moment. It starts up pretty fast because I'm not loading anything that, that heavy at startup time just to show you uh, what the data looks like. So I just found a, a data set on Kaggle that was around about more than a million lines. Uh, so we've got a bunch of um, we've got a bunch of complaints that uh, consumers have uh, lodged against uh, companies. Funny enough, Equifax came up quite a few times. Um, and if we just do a quick count of how many those are. Uh, quite a few rows. So uh, generally, I just use this data set. Not, uh, it's not uh, intensive in terms of relationships. Um, I'm not doing views or anything like that. I just wanted enough data to scan down to see if any of the async stuff uh, makes a difference. It was similar to what I did at uh, PostgreSQL. So we'll have a look. Can anyone see that, by the way? A little bit larger, or is it fine? OK. So we've got um, Sanic running. And as you can see, no uh, meme at the end. Um, so just to go back to that code. Um, so first, the async only, so single process, single thread, and only async runs, and then the multi-process runs. So the interesting thing that we see, obviously, because we're just doing mostly network calls, there isn't much of a speed up. Um, we're looking at 8.2 seconds versus 8.5, um, but, um, that's a single worker handling a fairly large amount. Now, I, I, I can increase it, but not with the async stuff, uh, the async PG, um, because I wrote that horribly fast this morning. Um, but uh, for the most part, um, Sanic really handles the incoming uh, requests quite well with its async. Um, so if we gut it a little bit, and take out all of the Postgres side of it. So now we're doing pretty much very low um, disk I.O. Uh, tasks. We're just doing a simple um, get, and it returns a UID and hello world. Um, but we're seeing fairly uh, fast responses, and typically that's what's going to happen. Sanic is pretty quick, but as soon as you write a really slow uh, uh, code for accessing Postgres or anything else, uh, it's probably going to kill. Um, so I think it was about 20 requests per second with uh, async PG and what you. Uh, minutes. Okay, cool. Um, so clearly, what you would have to do is set up a larger async PG pool um, to handle more uh, requests. Uh, well, more requests to Postgres itself. So what uh, what I haven't shown you is that I killed uh, my connection. Uh, there was a connection limit that I went uh, over. Um, so other things to look at, so I've talked about AIO multi-process, a uh, really interesting project. Um, and that's generally that. And um, this is kind of what my architecture looks like at the moment. So, and, and this is why I went for Sanic, um, partly because I needed to teach other developers how to use it, not just write my own crazy code, but because I've got a lot of um, internet-facing services that I need to integrate with, so the insurers, uh, intercom, uh, chat service, Slack, to um, actually 
let my colleagues know when someone's struggling, and at the moment I'm still using Firebase as a primary uh, database, which will move into AWS or wherever at some point. So most, for the most part, SANIC is running on this end, and we've got async workers uh, running off a SQS queue that SANIC um, keeps putting stuff on the queue. Um, and so far, to be honest, a pretty good experience. Um, and my version of an async joke of how you would approach this in the future and go home and learn. So I think that's, uh, I worked out 24 hours for that. If I remember, it was really late and questions. So that was kind of just a deep dive. Um, ask me in six months if it was a good idea when I'm live and in production. Um, so your Twitter handle is awesome, Cryptic Goose. Yes, so because everyone calls me Goose, and sometimes I'm known to give cryptic answers. There we go. Can you tell us about these OWASP meetups in Cape Town? How often do you hold them? Uh, so we've been a bit lapsed this year, but we try and do every two months. Um, we, there used to be a OWASP Joburg, um, but a lack of interest kind of just let it fade out. There's also in Cape Town and in Joburg every now and then a thing called Xerox Coffee, also security kind of uh, feel to it, but we literally just get together and have beers. So a WASP, we do talks, we talk about a WASP top 10 or any interesting stuff we're busy working on. Uh, B-sides, people present at the end of the year, anything interesting. So we've had uh, things talk there. We've had a lot of other companies talk about what they're doing. So we're big on uh, security with developers. So how can we as a developer community be better at security? Awesome, cool. We have some questions. Hi, cool talk. Um, I've got two questions. Uh, sure. First off is, just want to check with us, um, what's the project's name again? Uh, Sanic. Sanic has um, uh, web sockets. And then secondly, how does it compare in performance to the AIO HTTP uh, base, just HTTP server library in terms of speed? Um, so I haven't actually compared it uh, to that, so I can't tell you. I think they used to say that uh, Sanic could hit 1,000 requests per second on a single worker, but that was literally Hello World. So um, I think my follow-up research will be to actually compare it to different ones. Um, the streaming side of things, or the WebSockets rather, uh, just give me a second. I haven't really tried the WebSockets yet. Um, but compared to the rest, um, it's fairly trivial. Uh, let's see. Oh, come on. Ah, oh, there we go. So um, with the web sockets, you tend to send and receive and then close it yourself. There's a little bit of boilerplate around it. It also has streaming, and the streaming is also the same. So the other side will keep the connection open. You'll keep sending, or you'll keep uh, receiving. Um, and all of this around the async stuff. So this uh, is rather comparable to, uh, uh, there's uh, another, last year at PyCon, uh, Adam Jorgensen was talking about a async framework I just forget the name now. It also had web sockets, but uh, that's something I'll try s myself next because um, a mobile app web sockets would work really well for me um, because some of some of the requests uh, just need to be quick and it updates every now and then. So keeping it open for a while rather than just doing the constant um, HTTP. Another question. So just having followed sort of Python release notes, I see that the last few versions they have been working on async code performance, doing things like implementing the future class in C. Have you sort of seen much of that? And do you know if it's catching up to UV loop? 
Um, so maybe let me just explain the UV loop thing. So um, it's it's kind of a personal choice for Magic Stack and um, and Sanic. So the guy at Magic Stack they constantly bring stuff into the standard lib. The problem with UV loop is it's quite large. So um, I think the async IO general loop will catch up eventually, but at the moment, it's kind of just a preference for them. So um, I try and stay as up to date with my Python version, and so far they've kept up, but it's easy because they're just using UV loops. So um, uh, it's mostly from, from what I've read in uh, one of his talks, he said they want to keep async IO's main loop uh, simple. Um, because to maintain it is is going to be a problem for them if it's way too complex. And if you look at a uh, UV loop, uh, it's already Cython on top of libuv, and now you have to track libuv changes and and UV loop changes. So I think uh, maybe for for a more stable system, stick to the normal loop. You can literally, when you're installing pip, you can just tell it to ignore UV loop. But um, it, it's, it's, it's an interesting implementation. Over time, it's better that we just stick to improving the standard library and just having it without out having to pip install or import anything, just have everything in ready to go. Uh, so how much easier is it to write vulnerabilities with an async web framework? Did, did somebody consider putting the SSL handshake on the event loop? Or? Um, yeah, so... I personally wouldn't. I would rather have Nginx handle um, <laughs> termination. Yeah. Um, and the the first thing that I had to explain to my colleagues is why why we can't do those long um, calls to the insurers on the APIs because if it takes 30 minutes, guess what's going to happen with the DDoS? Um, I, I actually have a note somewhere on my laptop to start looking at async vulnerabilities, but I haven't really looked looked into it very deep, but um, I haven't looked at their, S their way of handling SSL, but I'd be cautious because it's still a new project. Mm. I'd rather have Nginx terminate because um, yeah. I personally put Nginx in front of Sanic, yeah, and there's good. a way to do it, and I'm y running it with G-Unicorn yeah. as well. I mean, if you do like an authentication or authorization check asynchronously and then you do something else of there, like that's an easy vulnerability. Yeah, um, especially if you're also thinking like, so with JWT, you're now throwing Redis into the mix as well. So now there's an async call coming in, you're doing an async Redis call <laughs> um, and you could lose the sessions or... So it, it is a... It is something I'll have to definitely look into, but I don't have any specifics. Are you excited about it? About it? I am. Um, the, the, the fun thing about security is the more we innovate, the more there's stuff to look at, right? So, um, I mean, I don't know if you were in the talk, uh, things talk about the DNS. I mean, they're doing a lot of twisted and async. Um, yeah. So the more we innovate, the more we'll find. Is no one going to ask, should you put this in production? <laughs> we'll watch your project. Say again? We'll watch there we go. I'll, I'll, I'll keep my Twitter up to date. <laughs> um, but, but to be honest, uh, it makes async, writing async code easier, but I often find that I forget about it and you end up writing blocking code. So uh, even though the boilerplate's taken away, you have to still have a conscious decision every day, check what I'm doing. And it also makes my life, some of the limitations to the insurers makes my life easy. The whole API is async, and I can't do asynchronous calls to the insurers. I have to do it one by one. So uh, it's constantly like breaking my mindset in between the two and making it work better. Uh, how's your team enjoying it? Uh, I'm really enjoying it. <laughs> so um, I have a front end developer starting on Tuesday. Um, I'm the developer until now, but um, because I've known Flask, it was really easy to pick up and get going. Um, I mean, this is about the real, real development happened probably about six months. Um, 
So for one developer, I would say there's a fairly decent work done just because it's much easier. Um, and uh, let me think of something interesting. Uh, I can't think of anything right now, but um, because I'm working with Firebase Intercom, everything's on the web. Uh, the async side of it really makes it uh, easy for me. Uh, most of the long authentication and stuff I do when the app starts up and after that, uh, it runs fairly well. Um, and uh, although a great tool, beware uh, AIO HTTP is client, it can get quite, quite boilerplate-y, especially when you put retries and stuff in. But I mean, coming from a request world, it took me about two days to port all of my requests, stuff, but the speed ups I've gotten are absolutely amazing. Cool, thanks so much for your time. Follow Cryptic Goose.